Um, all right, everybody. So it's seven past seven. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And I think tonight I'm officially <laughs> renaming the Sunday night class. It is now the inexhaustible Dharma Doors because it never ends. So from now on, let it be known, this is the Inexhaustible Dharma Doors with MC Owens, and we are going to continue our discussion of this idea of samadhi. I apologize to everyone who looks forward to the whiteboards. I look forward to the whiteboards too. I spent so much time writing out the 10 stages, the name, the Sanskrit names of the 10 stages, the 10 paramitas, the, the Sanskrit names of the 10 paramitas, and then the 10 samadhis that we've been discussing. So I've been reluctant to erase all that information. So again, I apologize to everybody who looks forward to the whiteboards. They'll be back next week though, because tonight is actually going to be our last discussion on the samadhi portion of the sutra. I don't care what happens. If it's like 829, I'm going to speed through the last few of these uh, samadhis to make sure that we cover them all. Um, but that being said, tonight we're going to continue our, our discussion, our inquiry into this idea of samadhi. I've spent a number of nights talking about it, uh, both within Buddhism and with outside of Buddhism. And I've spent a lot of time giving you various ways to think of this idea, this very important idea of samadhi. I'm going to continue with that tonight in terms of giving you more information. Tonight, um, get ready. Get ready is, is, is because there's a lot. We have a lot of information to cover. And so we're going to do this deep, deeper dive into this idea of samadhi. But from the beginning, I want to kind of establish what we're talking about, what we are definitely talking about. All right. Because again, what we're really trying to get at is what exactly is this samadhi idea? Like what exactly is that? And so let's begin with the reminder, of course, that we're talking about meditation. But what do we mean when we say meditation, right? Well, I, I'm pretty certain that you can think of samadhi this way. So I've, I've probably started the last few classes this way. The idea is, is that we're talking about attention, focus, awareness, and the idea of bringing one's attention together. Indeed, I even introduced one night that the word samadhi is actually samadhar, and samadhar means to bring together, to gather together. So starting with that almost etymological uh, definition of samadhi, I want to remind you that what we're talking about is a bringing our attention to the present, to the present moment, to the present location, to actually the very, very present experience that you're having. And you might say, but Michael, I'm listening to you. I, I, I'm there. Well, let's think about this again. The idea is, is that we begin a, a meditation with a mind divided I would say divided in time, where we have ideas from earlier today or even earlier than that on our minds. We have ideas of the future later on tonight, tomorrow and ahead of time on our minds. So one thing you could do, if you would like, a way to think about meditation and this samadhi is that we definitely want to try to jettison, let go of, anything imaginary, meaning the past is gone and anything that you're thinking about is only going to be an imagination of what could have been or should have been or might have been. Future, what could be, what might be, but also imaginary in that way. And so when we get rid of past and future, we're 
kind of left with the present in that way. And that's where we want to be. But then, as I've also mentioned, even our present awareness can be rather divided, divided between me right now, you listening to my voice, but maybe you have an awareness of other parts of your house, or you have an awareness of other noises outside of your purview. And so we will further gather our attention and further bring it to the present by only being aware of that which is in our immediate purview in that way. Then there's some work to do regarding this imagination I mentioned. Past, definitely imagination. Future, definitely imagination. But then there's even imaginary layers that we're kind of throwing onto the present moment. So we even have that sort of could be, might be, what if kind of idea towards this present reality. And so part of the practice is also about letting go of those imaginations as well, so that one is getting even closer to an almost, I wouldn't go so far as to say unmediated, but to a certain more direct encounter with one's experience. Now we can begin to talk about what we're going to talk about. Because samadhi is if you keep doing that, if you keep bringing it together, keep coming into the present moment. And you might say, but Michael, how could I get any more present than this, right? Well, that's what tonight's about. So if you're kind of with me on that, that meditation, at least Buddhist meditation in the sense, begins with a gathering of attention to the present, then samadhi is when we start to bring that even more into focus. And let me actually use that as an example. You know, we speak about this idea of focus, but I actually think that like, if you imagine like a camera, an old like a SRL type of a camera that you would manually focus, and this idea that things can get kind of blurry or they can get kind of uh, blown out, if you will. And there's this way of samadhi and focus being an interesting analogy, that it's a focusing, a clarifying in that way. So just kind of think about that as well, this word focus, but indeed that, that activity of kind of focusing in that way. So tonight, I want to begin with a revisit real quick of the ideas that we're talking about, which we've been discussing this beautiful sutra, the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. And the Bodhisattva has been on an epic journey, learning about all of these different stages and learning about all these different paramitas. And now we're almost at the end of the sutra and the Buddha in the sutra begins to explain these 10 samadhis that a bodhisattva will attain. That's the word that's used in the English is this idea of attaining a samadhi. And so the first thing I wanted to do tonight regarding samadhi is to address this language of attaining samadhis. And indeed, that is the language that is always used in Buddhism, attaining samadhi. And the word attain is, it's an interesting word. It's samapati, S-A-M-A-P-A-T-T-I. And that, the, the, the beginning of that word, sama, is related to our samadhi, all of our sama words that we've learned in Sanskrit. This bringing together, gathering together is the sam or sama. And so samapati is the word for these attainments. And if you were to go back to the kind of old Pali canon, to the Pali language, to the suttas that are preserved in the Pali language, there's going to be kind of two basic things going on. The first thing, which I mentioned last week that I want to repeat, it's a very important thing. I think it's maybe probably the most important thing that's come out of this. In regards to the, the Noble Eightfold Path, 
that I've obviously have spoken about a lot. The last two steps on the Noble Eightfold Path are right mindfulness and right samadhi usually translated as right concentration. I do want to talk about that word concentration, but right sati or smrti and right samadhi, right mindfulness, right concentration. Right mindfulness. What is, what is the right way to sati or smrti to be mindful? The right mindfulness is in the early tradition always defined as Awareness of the body, awareness of sensations, awareness of chitta mind states, and then awareness of dharmas. Those are the four foundations of mindfulness. And that's the right way to do it. That's right mindfulness. By becoming aware of the body first, which of course is a great way to jettison the past, jettison the future, and even jettison that which is outside of our purview, is to become aware of the body, sensations of the body, reactions, temperature, heat, discomfort, comfort, whatever. And then bringing one's attention to mind states. And then finally bringing one's attention to dharmas, things like the Four Noble Truths, the Five Skandhas, and meditating, concentrating, focusing on those dharmas, like the relationship between clinging or wanting and suffering. That's a noble truth. And one could meditate on that noble truth in the fourth foundation of mindfulness. So that's right mindfulness. And when we hear in the Noble Eightfold Path, the eighth step on the path is right samadhi. What's right samadhi? Well, last week I told you that the Buddha usually says right samadhi is the four dhyanas, doing the dhyanic practice doing the four stages of dhyana. That's right samadhi. That's interesting. That makes it sound like dhyana is samadhi. And so if you've heard or are familiar, of course, I assume you are with this idea of dhyana, that's yet another technical term in Buddhism to describe this sort of um, trance-like state of awareness. And there are four stages of this trance-like awareness that move from a state of rapturous bliss in the first stage, all the way to upeksha, equanimity, the fourth stage. And you know, from everything that I have gathered, that really is where Buddhism would prefer us all to be. Not actually in these deep samadhis that I'm going to mention, these deep samadhis, I often think of them and I relate, relate them to people as being like sleep. They are very, very still states of mind where the mind and the body and the heart and everything can rest and heal. But then we come out of these deep meditative states. So samadhi, what we're talking about tonight is sort of just this one aspect. But I would suggest that that fourth dhyana of upeksha, equanimity, is really the sweet spot of the middle path of Buddhism, really the sweet spot of the practice in a way, is to not just attain that equanimity and upeksha, but actually to live in a state of equanimity. Okay. So there, there you have it. The Buddha says, you know, what is samadhi? Well, it's the four dhyanas and then upeksha, equanimity. But there's also used in the early Buddhist tradition, this word samapati that I mentioned, which means attainment. But in the early Buddhist tradition, the attainments, the, there were four attainments. And these are often sometimes called the four samadhis. This is where it starts to get confusing, everybody. This is where it starts to get like, wait, wait what's going on? But the, there is this term samapati, which means attainment. And I want to, we're going to talk about that more too. It's going to come up a lot tonight. But traditionally, again, traditionally meaning the early Buddhist tradition, there were these four samadhi attainments that you got there by doing the dhyana, by the way. You got there by doing the mindful practice of body sensations, mind, and dharmas. This is how it happens. But the idea is, is that a meditator 
would attain these four levels of samadhi. And these four levels of samadhi are, if you aren't aware, they are this sort of, um, they're called ayatanas. Ayatanas sort of mean a base in a sense. You can kind of, at least for tonight, think of that as a resting place for attention. And so the first foundation, or sorry, let me use my language very properly. The first ayatana, that first resting place of attention is akasha, space, sometimes translated as infinite space. And as I often like to say, akasha, space here, it's not outer space and it's not black void of space. Space actually has no qualities whatsoever. It does not have a color, so it is not black or, or brilliantly white or anything like that. It has no color, it makes no sound, has no smell, has no taste. You cannot touch or feel it. And there's a way in which you can't actually even think about it. Space, that is. The idea is, is that what space is, is uh, I often like, people know, I often like to interpret this idea of Akasha or space as allowance. Space is an allowance. And what space is, is indeed, this is, this is my favorite game or whatever uh, example of it. How many? How many? And so your mind might be like, ah, what's he talking about? <laughs> like, is he talking about his hand? In which case it's one. Is he talking about his fingers? In which case it's five. Or is he talking about this little rectangle in which it's like, ah, uh, one person, uh, one whiteboard? Like, and what I just did to you there when I say how many is your mind is like, I'll answer you, Michael, but I need to know <laughs> a little more information. Because the idea is, is that if I say fingers, you're going to, in your mind, create space between these five fingers so that there can be five. In other words, it is this space that allows for the conceptualization of fingers. But if, I, if you thought I meant you, my hand, you would now create, I don't wanna say create, but you would sort of require space between my face and here to distinguish the hand. And of course, when I initially asked the question of how many, there's a way in which your mind is staring at infinite space, just waiting to delineate something to count. And that's the idea of the, the, it's a trick question of how many. In order to count, you need separation. You need that space. So in other words, space is an allowance. And there's a way in which at any given moment, there is an infinite amount of space and the, mind's in a, the mind in a way makes order out of space. And that order is what we call form. And so rupa or form in Buddhism is, it requires space in order to function and this isn't a Buddhist idea, of course. You know, the Greeks had an idea of space. Most cultures have had this idea of a spatial dimension, which is what allows for there to be objects. The, the example that I often give, this happens with time and space. If all things are occupying uh, the same space, they are in a way, by definition, the same thing. And when you separate them and they are in two different spaces in that sense, and you have this separation, now, now there can be two or five or 10, and it goes forever and ever and ever. But what's interesting is that underneath that counting game or division game or discrimination game, underneath it is this dimension of space. 
again, it gets very tricky to call it anything, a dimension, a substrate, a, all of those things. An example that I've given, or I guess an analogy that I've given is you, you can kind of think of space as the canvas upon which reality is painted. But if you want to do that, as, as, a, as a stepping stone or you know, as, a, as, a, as a preliminary way of thinking about this, if you wanna think of space as a canvas upon which the colors of form or the material of form is painted, you can do that, but just add this to your image of it, that the canvas is co-created with the painting. So it's literally like as you are creating the brush, brush strokes, the canvas is is forming at the same time. So there's this intimate relationship between form and space in that way. The idea though is, is that it, if you were able to, and you could do this with anything, of course, by the way, um, there's usually some specific things that are used for this. But the idea again, is that the realm of infinite space is everywhere. And it's just the mind discriminating that is kind of creating again, the form. And so if you continued that process we were describing of focusing, bringing attention and awareness, there's a way in which you could almost in that focusing uh, process, go past or through the realm of form to just the realm of space that's underneath everything anyways, in that way. And if the mind were resting there on that realm of infinite space, that would be a kind of singularity, if I can borrow a modern expression. And the reason why I say that is, is that within these samadhis, and by that I mean the samapattis, the attainments, within these attainments, well, there's an understanding, and, and in some cases, it's, it's an implicit understanding, that there is no subject-object relationship in samadhis in that sense. There is just a kind of oneness. We discussed this in classes in a few Sundays ago, where a general definition of samadhi is union or oneness. That's a kind of common way of understanding samadhi. And what I want you... What I want you to see is how this particular samapati, this particular attainment of the akasha ayatana, the ayatana of infinite space, I'd like you to see how there's a way in which if one is like wrapping the self and the other all in this realm of infinite space, there is a sense in which that would be a union or a oneness. So we have that in terms of the samadhi. There's also a way in which that would be focused, concentrated. So that kind of explains translating samadhi as concentration or focus. Everybody okay with this initial idea of the attainment of these uh, first samadhi? I have a question to space, um, Michael. Yeah. Um, can you say anything about uh, if in in that context, if space is in any kind of relation to time, or does time doesn't play a role in this context? Thank I you. I should have finished my my earlier thought. So I mentioned that space is interesting because if something occupies the same space it's the same thing. But if you create a, a separation between the two, you now have these two spaces or locations, I should say. Times very similar in which there's a sense in which if there weren't space, meaning time separations, there would be a collapse of all events happening at once. <laughs> and so there's a good thing there's time in that way. So to answer your question, Connie, more explicitly, Time, space, all these things are going to be after Akasha. Akasha is going to be this, you know, truly, um, well, let me actually, let me, 
go to the second, third, and fourth samapattis real quick. So in the original, and I'm going to remind you that we're only talking now about the original old school Buddhist practice in which there was the right mindfulness, body sensations, mind states and dharmas, and then right samadhi, which is doing the dhyana, focusing, trance-like state. Then the idea is that one could attain these samadhis. The first being a realm of infinite space. So there's a complete dissolution of form in that way. And so infinite space. However, if you were following what I was just uh, talking about regarding like how many or what have you, there's an interesting relationship between consciousness, what's called vijnana, so awareness, consciousness. There's a very interesting relationship between consciousness and space. I already mentioned that there's a way in which the mind, or in this case, consciousness, needs or requires space in order to make sense of this. Because if there were no space, it would all start to collapse into one thing. But I have, there's space, there's space between us now, right? So that idea that consciousness, vijnana, it sort of requires space. So this hand now represents the ayatana, the akasha ayatana, the, the ayatana of space. And consciousness, which a moment ago was aware of a bunch of different things. So consciousness is aware of this and aware of that. But I'm aware of this and I'm aware of that because of the space. And so you could drift into a samadhi of infinite space, but there is a consciousness that is aware of infinite space. And that consciousness would otherwise be aware of a bunch of dazzling uh, things of form. But that consciousness is no longer in a way discriminating dazzling things of form. And so the consciousness is just on the base of space. Consciousness, base of space. In the second samapati, the realm of infinite consciousness, what happens is, is that we remove even the space. And now it is just your consciousness, just the consciousness aware but not aware of anything, not aware of space, not aware of forms, not aware of yesterday, not aware of tomorrow, not aware of the imaginings, but actually just consciousness. I, I want to, I, I like to, to say this, but I don't want to say it too definitively. Okay. Cause I don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers or like start a controversy or anything. But I know that there's a lot of talk in the meditation world about, about consciousness being aware of consciousness or the mind meditating on the mind or something to that effect. That's not this, actually. Because what it is, is, is that right now there's the mind humming away. Ooh, 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 ooh. And it's very stimulated by all this form, the realm of form. But through the focus and concentration, you slide into the realm of infinite space and it's just infinite space. There's nothing to really think about anymore. And if you were, if you understood, I'm with you, Eric, one second. If you were with me on the idea that this space is, you could interpret it as allowance right? That it, it allows for things to exist, but it isn't anything existing. It's the allowance. If, if you can vibe on that feeling of Akasha, that it's just this like possibility or allowance, then that first Samadhi of infinite space, it's kind of sweet because it's like infinite possibility. Nothing has arisen out of it yet, so it like it could be anything, but it's nothing just yet. So it's this infinite allowance, and the mind or the consciousness is aware of that infinite allowance. But then even that moves away 
And in this second samadhi, the second samapati, the second attainment, it is infinite this, the aware consciousness, but it's not aware of anything. And what the description is in some of the more technical books that I've shown you in, in the few nights ago, in the more technical descriptions of this, the way that it is understood is, is that the mind, because of basically samskara and karma in terms of action, there's like a momentum of thought. And there's a way in which, of course, entertaining the mind with things of form propels that wheel more and more and more. And so when one moves into the realm of infinite space, infinite allowance, there's nothing to delight the mind. There's nothing to entertain the mind. And so the mind has this period of just this infinite allowance. But when even the allowance is let go of, there's still going to be a kind of residual hum of consciousness. And this is the way it's described, is literally like an after effect of consciousness. And if you can kind of chill in that second samadhi or that second samapati of infinite consciousness, this is the vinyana ayatana, infinite consciousness, the idea is, is that over enough time, the residual hum of consciousness eventually subsides and one arrives at the third samadhi, this third samapati, which is, it's called the akimkanya ayatana, the ayatana or the base of infinite nothing. Nothing. And I, I often like to, to, to mention that if you're confused about what nothing is, you can think about a time when you've been blacked out and think about how that was when you were blacked out. And the point is, there was nothing going on at all. Now, I'm not saying that the third samadhi is being blacked out. I'm not saying that whatsoever. What I'm suggesting is, is that if you'd like to know what nothingness is, you, if you've been blacked out, or every night you fall asleep and there's a void in which you are not aware of anything, and then you're dreaming, and then there's a void in which you're not aware of anything, and then you're, you're awake again. That period, unless there is mental activity, in which case that's not what I'm talking about, but that period of bl blacked out or between waking and dreaming, it's akin to this nothingness that we're describing. It's absolute stillness. That's the third samadhi. Before we mention the fourth, I want to, uh, Eric had raise his hand. So I want to make sure I uh, get to Eric. Yeah, well, just to point out like two samadhis ago that uh, you just gave an ex excellent explanation of Nama Rupa in terms of or the fourth of the 12 links of dependent origination. Because, yeah, I've been thinking for a while about that Nama Rupa name and form because it's the link where it's kind of circular. And I've been trying to wrap my head around that circular dependency between name and form. So nah, yeah, I just wanted to point that out that, wow, thank you, Michael. Cool. Thank you, Eric, for pointing out that. Uh, Chiozzo. Yes, um, thank you so much for this explanation. So my question is, what is actually happening in order to propel the awareness from one samapati to the next one. So in the first one you're you're and also I wanted you to explain if you could why why this expression of infinite infinite space why is that added to the translation? Sorry, too many questions at once. <laughs> no, no. Not at all. Yeah. So your first question about the movement between them that's um also something that I would have 
I will attempt to avoid any definitive statement about. However, my general feeling about it and my general understanding from my studies is that, and I, in many ways, it's actually why I started tonight's talk the way I did by saying, you know, we have past and, and future. We have that which we don't know or can see. We're bringing it in. We're bringing it in. My, my feeling about the progress between these is that you can almost, it's, it's truly an analogous. It's truly an analog that if you can kind of imagine a very, I don't, you know, this is not very hard for me to do, but imagine a very harried mind, like a very uh, concerned about the past, very worried about the future, very sort of um, confused, divided, all of that. And I'm able to do it. I'm able to just by the Buddha's right mindfulness, I bring in, you know, bring to attention to the body. Breathing is the first aspect of the body, by the way, if I didn't mention it. So awareness of breath. Ah, and so now past and future do not seem as important. They don't seem as fixed. In fact, I'm not even really entertaining them anymore. Whatever happened there, from a moment ago when I was nuts and I was really immersed in this past, present, future thinking. And then I do this mindfulness, this magical practice of sati or shmurti mindfulness. And I have magically come more into the present from that. If if you can understand that, then the analog is to keep doing that, keep making that progression towards, well, this is actually getting very close to the point I wanted to make, which is there is a translation of samadhi that will be very helpful in finishing this answer, the first part of my answer, which is, Samadhi is often translated as single pointed awareness. And indeed, there's even Buddhist traditions, many other traditions as well, but there are Buddhist traditions of literally picking a spot on the wall and laser beam eyes, like really trying to just focus on that spot. And when the attention wanders, it's kind of like a breath awareness. When the attention wanders, you bring it back to the breath. Well, when your focus wanders, you bring it back to that spot until you reach this single pointed awareness. And the way that that would happen is, and actually let me give you a, uh, Chotso, let me give you even better answer to your question of, of how this happens. I really believe that this is about stillness. And so when one's mind is in the past, in the future, very worried, da, 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 it is moving very much. And as one calms down, shamatha would be the word, as one shamatha, as one calms, let's go of these, all this stuff and is bringing it in. There's a way in which everything is moving towards stillness stillness of the mind, stillness of the body, stillness. And so that single pointed awareness is a state of stillness in a way. You, your second question was very interesting and I just forgot it. Um, why infinite is added to the translation? Such a great, great, such a great question. So it, I say it because it's standard to say it. The reason why I think, actually, I don't know why, because you are right, you are correct, that these words are, it is the Akasha Ayatana, Vinyana Ayatana, Akimganya Ayatana, and then the Naiva Samya Nisamya Ayatana, the neither perception nor non-perception Ayatana. There's no reason to add this uh, um, superlative in a way of, of infinite, 
my feeling about it is, is that because Akasha isn't outer space and isn't black void of space, Akasha is its own idea that can be transited as space. My feeling is, is that it became standard to add this little, well, infinite space. So it's not just like outer space. It's like, it's all space. It's infinite. And that kind of stuck, but, but uh, good looking out on the language though, because that is not implied in the Sanskrit. And there's a way in which I think it's just sort of like unnecessary in a way. But. Well, I just, I just wanted to mention that in relation to that, because it's a super important point. I but for me, the idea of infinite space doesn't suggest so much all space, but fit the sort of locational space or physical space because when we think of infinite we often think of at least mm. i do distances and if this is not physical space that we're talking about or space in the sense of location then i think it's really misleading to add the infinite do you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> sorry I, no 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 i do and i've almost made it a personal mission of mine to clarify <laughs> what space really means because i actually think that this idea of what space is, the separation, or what I call allowance, it's kind of really special, a very special idea in a way. And so... Yeah, the allowance is super helpful. Thank you for that. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, by the way, I just mentioned it, the fourth samadhi in the traditional, in the traditional school is this neither perception nor non-perception. The word that's being translated as perception is samnya. Now, interestingly, that word samnya has the same prefix as our samapati and our samadhi. So samnya is an interesting word. It's of course, one of the aggregates. It's one of the five skandhas, form, sensation, perception. That's the one we're about to talk about. And then conditioning and consciousness. And we even talked about Vinyana, our consciousness, a little bit already too. But this perception is an interesting one. Perception, of course, is discrimination, by which I mean discernment. It's this idea of, of perceiving, perceiving that something is what it is in that way. Um, all of my students are going to laugh. Uh, um, if I can find it, there's a great, um, there's a great prop I have. Well, I could use a different one. You haven't seen this one. So what do you perceive? So the idea of perception is, is that you might perceive a rabbit or you might perceive a duck. This is the classic duck rabbit optical illusion, right? What perception is, is very, is just that, what you think you're looking at. And you think you're looking at something because of a vedana or a vedana, a sensation, a visual sensation in this, in this way. And you're having that visual sensation because of form. Does it have the form of a duck or does it have the form of a rabbit? So form, sensation, visual in this case, perception. Now, of course, the reason why you might think it's a rabbit is because you're conditioned to see things this way. Or if you think it's a duck, that's an aspect of your conditioning. And so right here, I've snuck in a great five skandhas little lesson here with this idea of in Buddhism, what makes you you is your eyes that interpret, that see this, your sensation, your perception, you might be a duck kind of a person, or you might be a rabbit kind of a person. And the reason why you would think it was a duck or a rabbit is because of your conditioning. And so then when it gets around to consciousness, being consciously aware that Michael has a rabbit in his hand, right? Well, that conscious awareness that Michael has the rabbit, that just reveals your skandha makeup. It doesn't say anything about what's in my hand. It says a lot about your skanda makeup in that way. The key one there was perception, that, that what you perceived was this or that. 
So there's a way, of course, that you could say in Buddhism that you, in a way, are your perception in that moment, in that sense. This fourth and final samapati attainment in the early Buddhist tradition, the fourth samadhi is called the state or the ayatana, the base of neither samya nor nas, nasamya, no, no, asa, no perception. And this gets very interesting. Now, the perception, first of all, let me definitely be very clear about this. I cannot make any claims to having attained the ayatana of neither perception nor non-perception. So at this point in tonight's talk, we are, uh, this is just regurgitating what I've read, just regurgitating my studies, who, who I've studied under and what books I've read. Okay. But how I understand the state of neither perception nor non perception is that a moment ago in time, what have you, a moment ago, we were in the base of nothingness. Again, I likened it to a state of being blacked out where there's just no mental activity, there's no nothing going on. And again, if you're asking yourself, why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> Please remember, I consider these states to be like sleep. They are a restful state for the mind and the heart to heal and rest. So that's why one might want to meditate to the point of such stillness that it actually feels like there's nothing happening. Well, there's healing happening is sort of the idea in that way. But then if one, oh, and I should mention this too. So remember I just said about the conditioning, the samskara, that the reason why you might see a rabbit or a duck, it's kind of, a, a, it reveals your conditioning, right? It reveals the past images you've seen and, and this and that, right? So there's a, an interesting way in which conditioning truly conditions the way that we experience this world. In fact, you know, if, if um, the, the idea is, is if I showed up to your house and knocked on the door and you looked through the peephole and you saw, and you saw that, you might think there's a duck at the door. You might think there's a rabbit at the door. And the question in a way becomes, well, which is it? And the idea is it's, it's neither in that sense. And what I'm getting at is that there's a way in Buddhism in which conditioning's not great. <laughs> in fact, it's quite de uh, delusional, or at the at best, it's an illusion in that sense. And so, in the technical, te very technical discourse in Buddhism, what they say is is that it is necessary to go to the Akimkanya Ayatana, the base of nothingness. It's important to hang out in the Akimkanya Ayatana, the base of nothingness, because it actually gets rid of and clears up our samskara. And it actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because, you know, if, if I said, hey, I'm knock, knock, and you thought you saw a rabbit, and then I said, did you really? And you looked again, like you did it again, and you thought you saw a rabbit again, that would reinforce your belief, your hard, firm stance that that's what it is because of the repetitive exposure to that idea. That being the case, the idea is, is that in the meditative state of nothingness, we are not reinforcing our ideas. And so that conditioning gets ironed out or worked out or flattened or, you know, whatever, however you want to imagine it in that way. The idea is, is that if you successfully sort of iron all of that out, you enter into abide in or attain this state of neither perception nor non-perception. And how I understand that, again, strictly theoretically, is that if I understand it correctly, which is that one's conditioning has been ironed out, 
then one is not predisposed to think things about things. One doesn't, in a sense, have prejudice. And we're not just talking about gross racial prejudice, we're actually talking about presuming anything about anything. In other words, how I understand the state of neither perception nor non-perception is that it's not perception like a deluded fool that thinks it's a this or a that and, is, and believes it's this or believes it's that. So there's no perception going on, but there's not non-perception going on in this fourth samadhi either. And that's where this fourth samadhi is spoken about as in a way almost akin to enlightenment or nirvana in a way, because it's a mode of awareness that is not perceiving. But remember, perceiving means discriminating. So in other words, the state of neither perception or non-perception would be much more tuned into the actual form of this with no convictions that it's a this or a that. However, I want to make it very clear that when you go through these states, these attainments, especially this one of nothingness, it does not make you a mindless zombie that can no longer discern anything. You're very aware of how everybody else is perceiving things. It's just you are no longer so conditioned to see things that way. Yeah, Tanya. Yeah, again, I was just thinking about because the word the word we're using perception here is really in relation to conditioning. So like if the conditioning is gone, um, you know, I still want to use the word perceiving, but it's like you're perceiving in a way that's not that's has nothing to do with conditioning. I think that's why it's this crazy long Sanskrit naiva samya niya samya. Like it's a really long, crazy conjugated or conjunction. And I think it's because of what you just said. <laughs> it, it, like we don't quite have a word for what that would be to perceive without conditioning. It would arguably not be perception in that in that sense. Yeah. Right. But I think that but say but that really also helps me think about the like non-perceiving part of that equation. It's like because it's really in relation to the conditioning. Absolutely. But talking about per, the word perception here. So absolutely that's really really helpful. Yeah, Chotso. Um, so I've heard um, the word samnya translated with distinguishing. Um, is that acceptable? Oh, totally. Maybe. Yeah. Let me, and actually, I didn't finish a thought. Let me finish it. That beautiful, that be oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm just going to, sorry. I'm oh, yeah. hitting a mute button. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, so the word samnya. So that sam part is, again, it's related to samapati. It's related to samadhi. And it means together, bringing together. The second part of it, nya is a the root that's the root of jnana jnana is knowledge jnana is also the tenth paramita by the way but jnana is just knowledge and then it's actually very helpful to know about jnana knowledge because it's actually where the english word knowledge comes from the english word know comes from jnana if you notice where your tongue goes when you first start to make the word jnana, you'll notice it's the same word as to know something. And that word to know and knowledge, yes, it comes from the Greek gnosis, but gnosis comes from the Sanskrit word jnana. So knowledge is, is this idea of, of um, well, to give you an analogy, jnana, if, if Jnana means knowledge, but it's all the knowledge in a way. Samnya is a type of knowledge. Pranya, if you've heard of pranya, that's another type of knowledge. But samnya, as, as this uh, aggregate is, what it means is, is that, so if you look at this, samnya I kind of would uh, technically translate it as associative thought formations. 
And what it is, is, is the reason why you might think that this is either an ear. Well, you might think this is an ear because you think this is a rabbit, but you might think this is the bill because you think this is a duck. And the, that way the mind works, which is that when we're trying to figure out what something is, the mind actually darts about and it goes, well, well, since that's a this and that's a that, it must be a that. So perception, let's call it samnya. It's about making these associations and being like, well, if that's a that and that's a that, this must be that. And what's interesting is, of course, that's what you're doing here is samnya. But what's important to notice is that that samnya is not correct. Like uh, Tanya was saying, there's conditioning involved in this, which is interesting. But that initial stage of just perception, it's about, again, it's this idea that the mind doesn't, doesn't just take something as a whole and is like, that's a rabbit. <laughs> it actually kind of, and this happens, you know, like in nanoseconds, but it's like, beep, 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 beep. oh, that's a rabbit. So it's, it takes all in everything. So that's the, what samya means. And so uh, uh, chotso, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to understand it in English, but it's helpful to know the roots of it. Michael, what I find interesting to just one thought is we kind of need some, we need this distinctive mind of making sense, not making sense of the world, but we need to know that um, when I see a car, that it is a car or so we, it's interesting. We need kind of conditioning to function in this world, but it's, uh, it's obscuring perception. I don't know. Like, <laughs> no, I know. I know what you're saying, Connie. And, and it's true. It's very true. And in fact, I think, the way I feel about your comment is the way I feel about a lot of things in Buddhism, that there's a way in which you're right, that we, we do need it in a way. However, there's a, um, there's a way in which we don't stop. We don't stop perceiving, or what I mean is, is or what I'm getting at is, is imagine, um, imagine you're afraid of rabbits. Imagine that you're afraid of rabbits and I come to your house and knock on the door and you look through the people and you see that. You might, you might get afraid or you, whatever because you don't like rabbits or you're afraid of rabbits. But the point, the point is it's not a rabbit. It's a duck. You miss you miss saw it in a way. And so what I'm getting at Connie is, is that while this perception is important, there's a way in which we can get ourselves into dukkha. <laughs> there's a way that we can get ourselves into trouble by forgetting that it's a perception, forgetting that it is a possibility among many. As soon as we start, and we are kind of doing this a lot, by the way, but as soon as we are like, no, it's that and that only, that's where we get ourselves into dukkha. It's where we still get ourselves into like some trouble in that way. But then it can get even worse when there's somebody that has a different perception than we have. And now we could get into an argument and how foolish when we're both wrong. But because we both think we're right, that's what leads to arguments and things like that. So in other words, there's just a lot of problems that go with it. And so like a lot of things in Buddhism, I think it's about, I mean, it's why they call it the middle way, frankly. But it's like the, the, the meter is all the way over here and we need to move it back towards the middle where yes, there's perception, but we are aware of how perception works and we're aware of all of that. Now, don't start swinging too far this way to where you're just in total, like, well, whatever, Bill, like, it's whatever, and you just, we, we can see whatever we want to see, and I want to see rainbows and, and unicorns everywhere, and it's like, no, that's not quite what we were talking about. Let's 
move this back to the middle where we're trying to let go of the stuff that's not serving us. And in, and, and in the words of the Buddha, we're trying to see clearly. That's this middle, uh, this, the middle way. Okay, I'm not nearly, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm not nearly through my notes, but that's great though, because these have been amazing questions. Um, I have one more, two more, six, seven more points to make. Um, I wanna make this point because it ties together a few ideas. So I'm gonna come back to the four samadhis we just talked about, don't worry. But I'm still in this vein of early Buddhism, the early way of thinking about samapati, the attainments, attaining these stages or these ayatanas. Um, I just finished a really lovely, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a Buddha, it's not a sutra, it's called the um, Sao, what is it? The Saundarananda. It's not a sutra. And it's called the, it's this beautiful little book and it's called Handsome Nanda or in other translations, Nanda the Fair. And Nanda was actually the Buddha's brother, half brother, because they had different mothers, but they were brothers in that sense. This is not Ananda, the brother's cousin, who is the one with great hearing who heard all the sutras. It's not Ananda, this is Nanda. And this is a story, it's not a, I mean, it's a story, but it's, an, it's a classic Sanskrit poem. In fact, it took me a while to find this because you don't really find this in Buddhist, in the Buddhist world. You find it like in the Sanskrit classics world, the uh, Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana and all of that. And that's because the Buddhist, the monk who wrote this epic poem, who by the way, is considered like, the greatest Sanskrit poet like ever, or like number one or two, depending on who, you know, your school. But Ashvagosha is the guy's name. Ashvagosha was a monk. He was alive around the year 100 AD or so. He was from India. And he wrote a bunch of, he wrote a famous thing called the Buddha Karita, the, 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 which is a very famous life of the Buddha. It's actually where we get all the stories of the life of the Buddha, the renunciation and all, like the life story of the Buddha actually comes from Asvagosha's poem. He wrote something also called the awakening of faith in the Mahayana, which is a very famous commentary that basically introduced China to Buddhism or Mahayana Buddhism in that way. And little did I know, because I had never heard of this until uh, a few weeks ago, he wrote this poem called The Handsome Nanda. And it's a, it's a great poem. I mean, it has its problems because it's old school Buddhism. So basically it's pretty patriarchal in that way. Women do not fare very well in this story. Nonetheless, the only reason I bring it up tonight though is because in reading it, it's, it's, uh, this edition is actually half in English, half in Sanskrit. So it's great because you can actually, if you know some Sanskrit, because I don't know a lot of Sanskrit, but I kind of know enough. So I can kind of try to read along on this side, but then I have the English. The reason why I'm telling you all of this, in the year 100 or so, when Ashvagosha got to, down to writing this epic poem, a big part of the end of it is about the path. It is about when, when Nanda decides to finally get enlightened and the Buddha walks him through the whole process. It's actually a really great story because it actually is, it, it talks about Nanda going all the way from being this like, basically like sex obsessed uh, guy all the way to becoming uh, an arhat. And it kind of outlines the whole practice. So it's very good for that. The thing that struck me the most when I was reading this though, is that when it gets to talking about dhyana and samadhi and that the thing that we had just talked about kind of all night tonight, Ashvagosha begins and, and he does it the first time and points out that they're interchangeable 
he uses the word yoga synonymous with samadhi. They, for, it, clearly in Ashvagosha's mind, they are the same word that what yoga means is samadhi. Now, I already pointed out a few nights ago, a few Sundays ago, that in the traditional Ashtanga yoga, the eight limbs of yoga, the eighth limb of yoga, traditional classic Asamkhya yoga, the eighth limb is samadhi. Like that's what it kind of is all about in that way. And I pointed out that the eighth step on the Eightfold Path is Samadhi too. Isn't that interesting? But what's kind of revealed to me from reading this poem is that yoga and Samadhi, at least for us, Vagosha and a lot of people are the same thing in a way. And that's interesting. Like that's, in, that's interesting. I guess it's interesting hermeneutically would be the word. Hermeneutics is this study of like the way language is used, not definitions of words, but like how they're used in context. And so hermeneutically speaking, this samadhi, yoga, dhyana, all of these, there's a, there's a way in which they seem to all be referring to the same thing, but then they can have nuanced differences. And so it might be troubling if you're wondering like, is a dhyana a samadhi? type of a thing. And it's like, well, maybe all dhyanas are samadhis, but not all samadhis are dhyana. That might be the way to say it. But anyways, I wanted to point this out to, to anybody, but just on that point about yoga, because you don't hear the word yoga in Buddhism that much. In fact, I've rarely heard it. He uses it a lot and it's used a few other places, but okay. Everybody ready to go a little further with samadhi? Because that, that was like an intermission, by the way. All right. So back to these four samapatis, attainments. So in the early uh, suttas, the Pali Canon, those are the samapatis. Those are the attainments. The four, uh, what usually are called the four formless samadhis, um, because those four states of space, consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception, take place in a formless realm, the Arupadhatu. But as we move out of the early, and that's what this was supposed to be, by the way, was a transition out of the early school into this, this world, the world of Mahayana Buddhism, I want to read to you from another book. So very quickly, um, so, I've already also mentioned this uh, wonderful encyclopedia of Buddhism by Nagarjuna called the Pranyaparamita Shastra, right? Or the Maha Pranyaparamita Shastra. Um, in that, and I'm, I'm reading from part of it, or actually I'm reading from somebody that's quoting from it. They, according to Nagarjuna, according to the Mahayana tradition, a Samadhi is... Uh, a samadhi is the means by which one attunes, rectifies, and stabilizes the mind. Skillfully to fix the mind on one spot and abide there without shifting. That is called samadhi. Okay, so that's according to Nagarjuna. However... The person who I was actually just reading from is not Nagarjuna. He's quoting Nagarjuna. He's saying, yeah, this is a Chinese Buddhist monk named Zhi, if you want to know. But he goes on to say, and this is what introduces the more Mahayana aspect of this. And, and it's going to get us back to these samadhis. Zhi says that the Dharmadhatu is a single point. And through true discernment, you can abide there and never stray from that. And so we need to have a quick discussion about the Dharma Dhatu in order to appreciate that profound statement that it's very profound, by the way, <laughs> like to take that idea of a single spot on the wall as a Samadhi, and then to have this guy say, oh yeah, and by the way, the Dharma Dhatu is a single spot too. 
So the, if you've been coming to the inexhaustible Dharma doors, you already know all about the Dharma dot two, but I never like to assume that everybody's been here before. So there's this idea in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. So not the early school that we've been talking about pretty much all night, but the later, not that much later either, by the way, but the Mahayana school, they have this idea and it's not that it's not present in the early tradition. It just gets fully articulated in the Mahayana. They have this idea of what they call the realm of the Dharma or Dharmas, the Dharma Dattu. And without derailing this and going into some whole other conversation with it's so late, I want to just ex like drop on you a way to think about this. So let's, um, let's see, could I possibly do this? Hold on one sec, this is gonna be fun. Okay, it's my blue screen. Ironically, welcome to the realm of infinite space. So let's get rid of my blue screen. Okay. All right. So behold my lovely screen that is usually behind me. And so look, a bird. Is it a bird? So <laughs> the idea is, is that I have here a screen, right? It's this kind of Chinese style screen, right? And the idea is, is that you could look at the bird and see the bird as an aspect of the screen. But that realm of infinite space, that realm, that, that realm of space is always right here, right? And so the idea is, is that I could say, let's just talk about the bird. And all of a sudden you can, in a way, conceptually separate the bird from the screen, even though the bird used to be an aspect of the screen. So now we take the bird and we can start talking about the feathers, the eye, we can talk about how the bird is red and that the red is a quality of the bird, right? And that the, the, the way, all of it, so now we're talking about the bird and the qualities of the bird, but isn't that redness a quality of the screen? Meaning this screen, but wait, isn't it a quality of this screen too? Wait a minute, this is getting trippy. Yeah, but my original point is, is that the red, when we're talking about just the bird, the, red, the redness is a quality of the bird. But when the bird is part of the whole, the screen, now the redness is part of the screen. It's not just a part of the bird anymore. Well, what if you could kind of keep doing that kind of zoom out to where things are no, like um, the colors of my water bottle as being characteristics of this, there's a way in which you could do a zoom out and it's funny that I should say a zoom out, right? But there's a way in which you could zoom out and start to see my water bottle, the screen, me and the bird, all of this as aspects or characteristics of this screen. Or you could kind of keep blowing out, keep blowing out until you begin to see things not as individual objects but as aspects of the whole and that whole would be the dharma dhatu and that's where jury can say that the dharma dhatu is a single spot because again if you kind of imagine the screen meaning this screen of the world of everything and even you and i just being aspects of that whole in that way that's how he can say the Dharma Dhatu is a single spot. And through true discernment, you can abide there and never stray from it. So that's sort of a different 
samadhi <laughs> than the realm of infinite space, consciousness, nothingness. It might be akin to the, the neither perception nor non-perception. My feeling about that, if I like my Buddhological, and there is such a world of study as Buddhology, my Buddhological assumption is, is that that fourth samadhi of neither perception or non-perception is similar to what Jiri was talking about, where you're perceiving the things of this world, but not the old deluded way. Yeah. All right. We did it. We made it to, oh, I don't have my list up anymore. That's all right. I'm going to walk you through them really quickly because I do want to get to the next part of the sutra. And I feel like, you know, we've, we're getting close to exhausting this idea of samadhi as far as we should be talking about it. So these upper samadhis, oh, actually, before I even get it back into them. So the sutra says, let me get back to my original sutra. The sutra says, da, 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 da. where is it? Right, furthermore, a bodhisattva who brings forth who, or who generates the initial intention for bodhicitta will attain the jewel revealing samadhi. We already did that one. Then the second upon attaining or upon uh, bringing forth, I should say, the second generation of enlightenment, they attain as a samapati. They attain this well-abiding samadhi. And then the third one that we ended with last time was, or no, then the immovable, a chala samadhi, then the non-regressing samadhi. That's where we got to last time. And before we dive back into these very quickly, I want to mention another possibility for how to understand these. So one way of thinking about this is that there is, so wait, we're about to get into the, the jewel flower samadhi. So let me use this as an example so that we do make forward progress here. So the bodhisattva who brings forth the fifth generation of enlightenment will attain the either precious flower, but it's actually a jeweled flower samadhi. All right. Now this sixth initiation of enlightenment, this sixth generation corresponds, if I still have my chart up, corresponds to the paramita of dhyana, meditation in that sense. Now it says that the bodhisattva in this stage or in this sixth level here attains this jewel flower samadhi. And there's one way to think about that, which is that there is this samadhi called the jeweled flower samadhi, and that it somehow like is a thing and bodhisattvas who make this sixth generation of enlightenment attain that samadhi. It's like the infinite space one. It's like, that's the one that they attain. That's one way you could read this. It's one way you can understand it. I'm not saying that's not it, but I think there's a more poetic thing going on here. I said this probably at the outset of, of all of this that I think there's a way that another way to understand these is that I, I guess the phrasing, the phrasing would sort of be like, well, what do you call it when a bodhisattva is in abiding in the sixth stage? Like what, what's that? Well, that's, a, that's like a jewel flower. It's like, you know? And so what I mean is, is like, it's a language thing, but it's a subtle, it's a subtle difference between those two possibilities I just stated. One is that there is this thing called the jewel flower and a bodhisattva in the sixth stage attains that. The other is that this is the name for a bodhisattva, the, the type of a samadhi that a bodhisattva gets into when they're that far along. And I know it sounds like I might, I'm like almost splitting hairs in that way, but I would, I would want to avoid turning these into something 
or like reifying them too much in a way. And so as almost a, a missing their more poetic nature, because I do assure you, the Mahayana and a sutra like this, when it's, when it's talking about jeweled flowered samadhis, it's not that they're, it's not that they're like making fun of early Buddhism and like the space, nothingness, consciousness thing. It's not that they're making fun of them, but I do think, and this happens a lot in Mahayana, where they look at the early tradition as being too rigid, too boxy, too whatever. And so there's this real like free spirit. It's why I love Mahayana Buddhism. There's this real free spirit feeling to it in that way. Um, yeah, and so I just want to point that out that these, the names of these samadhis, you know, there's different ways to think about them, if that makes sense, right? And so if you remember a bodhisattva who's about to abide in the sixth stage actually has a vision of either multiple women or a woman with flowers, uh, crowned with flowers, right? And so that is the corresponding vision to this samadhi of the jeweled flower. Then we get into these, um, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, that was the fifth paramita. Dhyana was the fifth paramita. I'm sorry, I was off one. We were on the fifth level, still talking about Dhyana, still talking about the woman with the flowers in her hair and still talking about the jewel flower Samadhi. If we move up a rank as Bodhisattvas, if we move up a rank and we initiate this sixth generation of enlightenment, which corresponds to the sixth Bhumi stage, which corresponds to the sixth Paramita, which is Pranya, right? Uh, transcendent jnana, transcendent knowledge, right? That's pranya, usually just translated as wisdom, right? This, the samadhi of a bodhisattva in the sixth stage, making the sixth initiation of enlightenment is called the light of the sun. Uh, it actually has a, a slightly longer name than that, but you can basically understand it as the light of the sun. And I mean, you know, pranya, wisdom, light of the sun, right? The, the corresponding vision that we were told about for the bodhisattva in the sixth stage is that vision of the lotus pond that they go into and start playing around in, one of my favorite of the 10 bodhisattva visions. You know, you take your pick, light of the sun, um, Um, I mean, you know, again, as we move up the ranks here, we get above my pay grade, as they say, we get out of my, you know, experience range in that way. Um, because there's a lot of, oh, it's so, it's getting on to, well, yeah, I got to make this the last Samadhi class. So really quickly, as we go up seven, eight, nine, ten. The samadhis after the, the light of the sun in the seventh stage when the bodhisattva is making the seventh initiation and developing their upaya, which is the seventh paramita, they're having a vision of the hell realms to their left and to their right, but they're making it through them un, un, uh, untouched, unharmed in that way. They achieve this samadhi, which is called the realization of all meaning. Yeah, and I'm going to, again, I want to speed through these, but only so I can, I can make a good statement at the end about them all in that way. So again, moving up, we, in the eighth stage, we achieve, achieve the samadhi called the torch of wisdom, right? Which corresponds to bala, power, in that way. Ninth stage bodhisattvas achieve the direct realization of all Buddha Dharma, all right? 
we are getting dangerously close to fully enlightened Buddhas at this point. If we are having a samadhi, it's about the direct realization of all Buddha Dharma, of all the teachings of the Buddha, of all the Dharma, direct realization until finally, 10th stage bodhisattvas making the 10th initiation of enlightenment, about to abide in the 10th stage, they have, or I should say they attain samapati, this samadhi that is called the shurangama samadhi. Shurangama means, it's usually translated as like unbreakable. Um, it has, I, I had on the board, I think I translated it as durable. The idea of the shurangama, it does have this sense of like unchanging throughout time in a way. So durable, but unbreakable is also kind of an idea. The idea of shurangama, unbreakability, is also related to an idea called vajra. The vajra, like the thunderbolt kind of an idea. By the way, too, there is a whole sutra called the Shurangama Sutra. There's even one called the Shurangama Samadhi Sutra. That's right. There's a whole sutra just about this 10th stage situation. All of these, though, all the way from our jewels manifesting to the well-abiding, immovable stage, non-regressing stage, all the way up to this Shurangama stage, the one common factor that like you should consider with all of them, I think, in thinking about them is this sense of unity, oneness, that sense of, of um, well, the reason why I took that moment to describe the Dharma Dhatu and kind of walk us through that way of seeing the reason why I wanted to do that is to, is to point out like how there you, how you could see the things of this world as one, not as a bunch of different entities and objects and things like that, but a unity or a oneness. And indeed that is, you know, from all of these Sunday nights that we've talked about Samadhi, that seems to be the idea of it, this sort of union, oneness coming together in that way. And so if you're curious about these 10 samadhis and you're kind of curious to think about them, then I think the way to think about them is to be curious about how they, how do they feel like they're one? How is it like, for example, Last week, we ended with the non-regressing samadhi. And I tried to give you an interesting like image of being on the tip of a light beam, right? And that if you actually, like if all the light coming at me here of this scene, if I were to kind of jump on the front of it and go, and go riding at 184,000 miles per second that way, it would be as if time stopped. And I was just going with this moment and yet non-regressing like a light beam, just ever moving forward, yet with a sense of stillness and oneness. For me, that's how I kind of vibe on like a non-regressing samadhi is like really kind of put myself on those feelings about it in terms of its unity or oneness. And I think you can go all the way up through these, all the way to this idea of unbreakable. And unbreakable, of course, kind of screams unity and oneness, doesn't it? Right? So I don't know, that was the best I could do coming in right at 8.30 with this statement about the Shurangama. All right, folks, I apologize for speeding up at the end. Um, but that will conclude our discussion of the samadhis. And the only reason why I'm not going to do more is because we're shifting next week to the 10. And actually there's more than that, but we're going to start with 10. The Dharanis that the 
the bodhisattva attains dharanis. Dharanis are usually translated as magic spells. I mean, I'm excited to get to dharanis, um, but I'm also excited to get to dharanis because uh, as a lot of people know, my uh, doctoral work that I did was on Durrani's and that's what I was interested in. And so I'm looking forward to sharing with you a lot of different information about uh, magic spells next week. So on that note, I'm gonna pass over to Noam. Thank you all again so, so much. This has been a, a great time.